after weeks of intensive preparation, structural modifications, and on-site engineering work, SpaceX has successfully conducted the first ever static fire of a Starship vehicle directly on the orbital launch mount. Let's break down what led to this unique test configuration, how SpaceX pulled it off, and what it means for the upcoming launch. The chain of events began with the destructive explosion of Ship 36 during a static fire test in June, which damaged the Massey test site, SpaceX's usual location for Starship engine testing. Rather than wait for Massey to be rebuilt or risk delays in the Starship program, SpaceX made the bold decision to static fire Flight 10 Upper Stage, Ship 37, directly on the OLM. This was unconventional as the OLM is designed primarily for super-heavy booster firings and full-stack orbital launches, not standalone Starship upper stage tests. To make it work, SpaceX repurposed a Starship transport stand, reinforcing it to serve as a makeshift static fire platform. Internal bracings were added to the Raptor vacuum engine nozzle extensions to prevent them from collapsing or warping during sea level operations. Steel plates were welded over stand openings to block lateral exhaust escape during ship static fires, protecting nearby systems. Meanwhile, all 20 booster hold down clamps were removed from the OLM to make space for the test stand. In their place, 20 adapters were bolted onto the hold down arms to secure the stand. Additionally, the team modified the booster quick disconnect hood by cutting into it and routing new lines to a fixed ship QD system mounted directly on the BQD hood. Unlike standard QDs that engage and disengage automatically, this new setup required a manual connection after the vehicle was mounted. Once ready, the stand was installed inside the OLM, and teams began preparing for ship stacking. By Monday morning, integration work on Ship 37 was complete. With its Raptors installed, flaps fitted, and plumbing finalized, the vehicle was rolled out to the launch site. The launch tower's chopsticks then lifted it off the transport stand and placed it directly onto the OLM marking the first time a Starship upper stage was mounted directly onto the orbital pad. Once in place, technicians began the meticulous task of manually securing the QD system. This involved linking the QD panel flanges, already mounted on the vehicle, to propellant lines routed through newly installed truss structures over the BQD hood. In parallel, teams connected electrical and data lines and ensured the vehicle was firmly anchored to the modified test stand now embedded inside the OLM. The first static fire attempt occurred Wednesday afternoon, with propellant loading proceeding smoothly. The engine chill phase, where cryogenic propellants flow through Raptor plumbing to thermally condition the system, completed without issue. However, moments before ignition, the test was abruptly aborted. The culprit was a boat that had entered the restricted marine exclusion zone in the Gulf of Mexico. This zone must remain clear during hazardous operations, and a single unauthorized vessel can halt the entire process. With the countdown stop, SpaceX scrubbed the test, detanked propellants, and safed the pad. Despite the abort, the attempt served as the first full-scale checkout of the new ship QD system. Engineers used the opportunity to validate the leak integrity of rerouted plumbing under cryogenic conditions, assess pressure stability, and evaluate flow dynamics in the updated configuration. The second attempt on Thursday afternoon was successful, with Ship 37 completing a nearly five-second static fire using a single sea-level engine, drawing propellants from its header tanks. This test aimed to simulate an in-space engine ignition, replicating the deorbit burn that starships will eventually perform to return from orbit. Similar short-duration burns were conducted during earlier suborbital flights while the vehicle coasted in space. A comparable in-space burn was likely planned for Flight 10, intended to demonstrate Starship's ability to reignite and maneuver using propellants from the smaller header tanks, critical for landing and precise in-space adjustments. The next phase in the pre-launch test is the full-duration six-engine static fire, expected as early as Friday, August 1st. After the six-engine static fire the ship will be transported back to the production site for a detailed review of test data, engine inspections, and pre-flight system verifications. Booster 16, its flight partner, has already completed all pre-flight milestones, including a full-duration static fire, and is technically cleared for flight. The only remaining hardware task is installing the hot stage ring. In parallel with vehicle preparations, SpaceX will return the launch mount to operational condition. This includes removing the temporary test stand, reinstalling the booster hold-down clamps, and dismantling the ship-specific QD hardware that was temporarily spliced into the main propellant lines restoring the original configuration of the booster quick disconnect system. If all proceeds as expected, Ship 37 and Booster 16 could roll out to the launch site within the next two weeks. A full stack would follow, 
after which final launch preparations for Flight 10 would begin. Elon Musk recently stated on X that Flight 10 could launch as early as August. Based on current activity, this timeline appears technically feasible. However, final approval still depends on receiving the FAA's green light, along with required airspace and maritime clearances. As Flight 10 gears up, preparations for Flight 11 are already in motion. Early Sunday morning, Ship 38, the next vehicle in line, and the final member of the current Block 2 Starship series, was transported to the Massey Test Facility for cryogenic proof testing. While the explosion of Ship 36 wiped out significant ground systems, including the methane tank farm and static fire stand, it left key cryogenic infrastructure untouched. Thanks to the survival of the liquid oxygen and nitrogen tank farms and the cryo test stand, SpaceX was able to proceed with Ship 38's cryo-proof test as planned. On Wednesday afternoon, Ship 38 underwent at least three rounds of cryogenic proof testing over a 12-hour period. During each round, teams filled the methane and oxygen tanks with liquid nitrogen to varying levels to simulate different cryogenic conditions. Simultaneously, hydraulic rams applied flight-like loads to the aft section, mimicking the thrust generated by six Raptor engines. The tests verified plumbing integrity and provided valuable structural data under flight-like stresses. Ship 38 is expected to roll back to the production site as early as Friday morning for Raptor engine installation and preparations ahead of its static fire campaign. Meanwhile, recovery operations at the Massey test site are progressing steadily. With debris from the explosion now fully cleared, attention has shifted to dismantling and replacing damaged infrastructure, particularly around the methane tank farm. The vaporizers, vertical tanks, and high-pressure pumps that were obliterated in the blast have already been removed. A new horizontal methane storage tank has been installed to replace the destroyed tanks, with replacements for the pumps and vaporizers expected soon. The original propellant feed lines running from the tank farm to the test stand were severely damaged in the explosion and have now been completely removed. Crews are currently excavating a trench in that area, strongly suggesting that SpaceX plans to reroute the new propellant lines underground for added protection against future incidents. Meanwhile, scaffolding has gone up around the static fire test stand, marking the beginning of hands-on refurbishment. One of the first visible changes was the removal of the damaged ship hold-down clamps. Further disassembly is expected in the coming days. Once repairs are complete, Ship 39, the first Block 3 Starship, is expected to undergo testing at the upgraded Massey site. Previously configured for Block 2, the facility is being upgraded to accommodate the larger, more advanced Block 3 ships at both the Static Fire Stand and Cryoproof Test Station. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. ISRO successfully launched the highly anticipated NISAR Earth Observation Satellite on July 30th, aboard a GSLV Mark II rocket from the Satish Dawan Space Center in Sriharikota. The mission proceeded smoothly, with the rocket's ascent and stage separations occurring as planned. Approximately 19 minutes after liftoff, the upper stage accurately deployed the satellite into a low-Earth, sun-synchronous polar orbit. Announced in 2014, the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission, or NISAR, is a groundbreaking Earth observation project jointly developed by NASA and ISRO aimed at revolutionizing how we monitor Earth's surface using advanced radar imaging techniques. At the heart of NISAR is a dual-frequency synthetic aperture radar system mounted on a satellite weighing about 2,800 kilograms. The radar waves bounce off Earth's surface, and the returning signal is collected using a 12-meter deployable mesh reflector antenna to generate high-resolution 2D and 3D images of Earth, unaffected by weather, cloud cover, or even total darkness. Positioned in a 747-kilometer sun-synchronous polar orbit, the satellite observes each location under consistent lighting, enabling repeatable measurements and full global coverage every 12 days. Once operational, NISAR will systematically observe the solid Earth, cryosphere, ecosystems, and global water systems. For the solid Earth, it will detect tiny crustal movements like tectonic plate movements, uplift or subsidence of mountain ranges, volcanic swelling or collapse, and slow-moving landslides, helping assess geological hazards and long-term deformation. In the cryosphere, NISAR will track motion and thinning of glaciers and ice sheets, providing vital data on how polar regions are responding to climate change and contributing to sea level rise. For ecosystems, it will map forest structure, estimate biomass, and monitor crop productivity. It can also detect deforestation, droughts, wildfires, and human disturbances, essential for understanding carbon dynamics and biodiversity shifts. 
In water systems, NISAR will measure river flows, wetland changes, soil moisture, groundwater shifts, floods, and coastal erosion, shedding light on water availability, flood risk, and climate-driven vulnerabilities. NISAR will generate up to 85 terabytes of data daily, offering vital insights for disaster response, resource planning, and environmental monitoring. All data will be openly available to researchers, governments, and the public worldwide. The mission's baseline is three years, with hardware built for at least five years, ensuring reliable long-term datasets. Overall, NISAR, a next-gen radar mapper born from the collaboration of two space powerhouses, sets a new standard in Earth observation through its cutting-edge dual-frequency radar system. Europe has advanced its Earth observation capabilities with the July 25th launch of two critical missions aboard Ariane Space's Vega C rocket from French Guiana. The payload included the four-satellite CO3D constellation and the microcarb climate monitoring satellite. Approximately 54 minutes after liftoff, the upper stage deployed the CO3D satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit at 495 km altitude and 90 degrees inclination, ideal for consistent daylight imaging. A second maneuver raised the altitude, releasing microcarp into a 650 km sun-synchronous orbit at around 1 hour and 41 minutes into the mission. The Constellation Optique and 3D or CO3D mission, a joint venture between Airbus Defence and Space and the French Space Agency, consists of four identical 285 kg satellites flying in two pairs, each separated by about 100 km in the same orbital plane. The satellites use stereo imagery to generate detailed 3D maps with 50 cm resolution, operating effectively even in low-light or nighttime conditions. They also provide 2D imagery for civil, commercial, and defence-related needs. Meanwhile, Microcarb, a joint mission by the French and UK space agencies, is a compact 190 kg satellite engineered to monitor atmospheric carbon dioxide, the primary greenhouse gas accelerating climate change. Equipped with a high-precision dispersive spectrometer, it measures global carbon dioxide levels with one part per million accuracy, on par with or surpassing many larger satellites in orbit today. Microcarb enables detailed mapping of carbon sources and sinks, monitors land and ocean carbon shifts, and provides vital data for climate modeling, national emissions reporting, and international policy planning. A unique feature of Microcarb is its ability to observe solar-induced fluorescence, a faint light emitted by plants in the red and near-infrared wavelengths as a byproduct of photosynthesis. This enables assessments of plant health, crop stress, drought conditions, and photosynthetic activity with unprecedented detail. Together, the launch of the CO3D constellation and microcarb marks a major leap in Europe's ability to observe, map, and understand our planet from orbit. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.